to all our viewers out there. Thank you for being back for our third episode. Right, so today we're going to talk about what's the best approach in learning. Um, so you notice today we have new equipment, right? And together with my panelists, we came prepared for another round of fun as well as storytelling. So uh, welcome back for those who have joined us. If this is your first time, thank you for joining us. If you have been following us, you're you are in a treat for another round of amazing sharing by trainers and facilitators who have been in the industry and just want to share with us what's going on. Cool. Now, uh, today's topic is about what's the best learning approach. And one of the things that we want to do this morning is to really understand a bit more what are the different learning interventions in the market, what people are using. We hear people say, I'm a facilitator. We hear people say, I'm a coach. We would hear people say, I'm a trainer. We hear people say I'm a mentor, right? We hear people call themselves consultant. So there are so many labels and so many things going out there. And one of the challenges, sometimes we get mixed up, right? One of the common things that I think if you ask a lot of the senior trainers, they get a bit irritated when people say I'm a facilitator, but they end up doing training. So there are some things that are going on right now out there. So today's topic is for you to gain some clarity as you go into the industry as you engage the industry, you're able to increase your level of professionalism by using the right terms and using the right technique when you're delivering. I'm wearing specs this month, shade this morning. It's not because I'm having an eye sore or a pink eye or anything like that. Part of it is, and I used to do a lot of team building, and this is part of the team building approach if you are very familiar with that. Right, so a bit about me for those who are not familiar. My name is Isaac, Isaac Peter. I'm the founder and CEO for People Performance. We are a learning specialist in the area of culture, leadership, and team. Now, I've been involved in mentoring new trainers since 2010. When I was in consulting, I used to mentor trainers in terms of skills development, technical development, uh, client engagement, and all. So that was my background. And, and one of the things that we want to do is to be able to really up, uh, build a next generation of trainers and facilitators who are competent in their in their skills and build up to a level of mastery. So later on, Captain Shan will talk to you about mastery itself. So that's what we want to be able to, uh, so that's what I'm doing. Now, um, one of the questions that I got uh, quite a few times is, Isaac, uh, are you going to be running a mentoring program? And the good news is we are planning to launch our three months mentoring development program for new trainers starting in August. If you are interested, please drop us an email or just comment in our Facebook so that we know of your interest and we can keep in touch with you. We plan to launch in August. We are currently putting it together. Um, <clears throat> so before I, before I introduce our panelists this morning, um, I thought it would be very interesting. If, if, we think about, if we think about life, there's always the birth and death, right? And it's, there's always this thing called significance as well as legacy. This morning, what my panelists and I would like to do is to celebrate the birthday of one of our panelists. We will not say who it is. But we are just going to sing it out and going to call his name. So to my <laughs> panelists, are we ready to sing for our birthday award? Yeah. Ready and go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Yay! And the first lesson we learned in virtual learning, never do synchronized singing. It just no. doesn't work. <laughs> it can, it can. After several tries, you probably get it right. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So that, that's the first free point. So Nazrin, uh, happy birthday and you know, look, really looking forward to you doing more stuff in the industry and really by your life being a blessing to others. Thank you very Let's much. Let's get the show started. So I'm going to oh. get my panelists to share about themselves, to give you a bit of background. So, so as you share, you know where they're coming from. I'm going to start with Nazrin. Nazrin, oh. please introduce yourself to our audience this morning. Hello everyone, my name is Nazrin and in a concise form, I am a full-time father and a part-time professional learning facilitator. Once upon a time, that was the other way around. I didn't like that. So now I've made it, made it work. <laughs> um, one of, uh, I, I started in the training industry in about 1997, uh, but really got serious in about 2008 when I joined a consulting company. And in that consulting company for seven years, my primary role was to quickly upskill line managers to become trainers. If you can imagine, 
they would come in to train for five days. They are the participants who would mainly be the, our own employees. Uh, but Saturday and Sunday, so if, if for example, Monday to Friday, they teach the course, Saturday and Sunday, they come in with me and I do a quick TTT to get them to be familiar with the course, to get them to understand how to teach, how to take all of their consulting skills and turn it into classroom skills. Uh, and that's what I did for about seven years. Uh, and as you can imagine, that made me work seven days a week. I enjoyed it, uh, but not so much uh, with, with the family. So I decided to leave. And now I'm an independent learning facilitator out here. I do a lot of my work in about three weeks in Malaysia, one week in Cambodia, if that's uh, But doing the MCO is not possible anymore. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, passing it on to back to Isaac. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Nazrin, for that. And, and really, Nazrin has a lot of experiences. Uh, one of his passions is Silat, and that's also influenced the way he does his training. Right. Uh, next, let's move on to Captain Chan. Hi. Uh, can you hear me uh, clearly, Isaac? Yeah. So good. So my my uh, basically instructor or, or learning uh, experience started very very young. I I was blessed. And I like to give credit to my Toguru, uh, General Dato Tairobi, who actually grew me when I was very, very young. I'm talking about something like, you know, 36 years ago, uh, when I was a young instructor in the Royal uh, Engineering School. We were instructors, we were taught about that learning, we were taught about pedagogy, we were taught about uh, facilitating processes and, and things like that. So anyway, so... And then I, I, I left and I was uh, in a uh, MNC uh, looking after uh, Malaysia and Singapore uh, for a training resource company. And then I went on my own. Uh, I'm on my own since 1997. Wow. Again, started my career uh, as an instructor, to trainer, to facilitator, and now coach. Now, currently, I, I do a lot of work in the areas of facilitation and uh, and certify people as, as, as facilitators and, and coaches. So enjoying every minute of it. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Captain Shan. Um, and Daniel, please Hi, introduce Hi, uh, morning. Morning, Isaac. Morning, everyone. Uh, morning. Well, my journey started in 1994. I've been a learning and development consultant as well as in the organizational development field. Uh, for the last 26 years. Uh, my area of uh, passion has always been in the Myers-Briggs type indicator, better known as psychological type. Um, and I've been teaching that since day one. Uh, and it's still, in, it's still my biggest interest. Uh, today, uh, after this 26 years, it's been uh, a long journey. So last uh, eight years ago, I started dabbling in coffee. So you can see I have a little coffee roaster here that's my wow. uh, little roaster room uh, and I have a little pamper here to make coffee uh, and uh, I run a, a, a barista school called Barista Guild Academy and it's a barista academy and a coffee school uh, and today I am sitting in a small little room in my wife's little cafe in Pantai Panorama so that's what I've been keeping myself busy. Thank you very much, Daniel. And for you out there, if you ever go to Daniel, be careful. He will roast you if you need roasting, right? Yes. <laughs> so, so thank you very much for that, Daniel. Um, and, yes. and, and indeed, I, I think I, the challenge for me for today's session is really in terms of how do we manage time over, over the discussion on, a, on a quite a number of things that we want to talk about, right? And we want to really go into... If I can say the, the practical side of it and not just talking at a theoretical level. I mean, if you open a book, you have different definitions and things like that. Now, to the to audience today, there, today we are going to discuss three questions. If you notice, previously it has always been four, but this time we are doing three. So it allows our panelists to share in more depth and hopefully that gives you some understanding. If you are going to ask questions, feel free to ask questions in the Facebook. Now, please type it and try your best to limit the questions specifically to this topic, because uh, this is what we're going to be discussing, right? Um, take note, next week we'll be talking about building strategic relationships. So if those conversations, those questions come across, if you can just talk for next week. So today we're going to talk about what's the best learning method, even if that point is, if that even is one. Uh, so the three questions that we're going to be exploring this morning first is, what are the differences between training, facilitating, consulting, coaching, and team building? And another one just came up, gentlemen. Um, 
platform speaking because yeah, I do see a lot of beginners <laughs> doing platform speaking and platform speaking trying to training. And, and we want to be able to talk a bit more about that. Is it the same thing? Is it yeah. different? So that's the first question. Second question would be, what are the pros and cons as well as challenges associated with these approaches? Right? So we're going to talk, we'll, go, we'll hover around the different ones. And for viewers out there, if there's any specific question, any specific um, quick query that you want to make particular to this, please put your question. So how well we are, what we're going to talk about today will come very much from your questions because they are, we just want to cover on the surface for now. And finally, and this is what I call the take home question is what should a trainer, uh, should a trainer or facilitator acquire all of these techniques or just master one? For the ease of our listeners today, um, and gentlemen, just please bear with me. Um, allow for the interchangeable of labels between trainers and facilitators, right? Because I think it's just to make it easy for everybody. I know we believe in the right word. So maybe you just can clarify, but so let's just uh, work together on that, right? Let, let's begin with the first question. What are the differences between training, facilitating, consulting, coaching, platform speaking, as well as team building, right? Um, I'm going to open up to the floor. And the first person who raises their hand, which I can see, will start. Oh, no, let uh, me put it there. The last person to raise up the hand will start. What? <laughs> the last, okay, Captain Shan, from my screen <laughs> to the last. So please get going. Hi, right, thanks. Okay. Um, well, but for me, all these approaches, whether you, you know, training, um, consulting, facilitation, coaching, uh, platform speaking, uh, I will leave platform speaking aside first. But the rest is all uh, is adding value to developing people. Right. All right. So for me, training is more, you come with more content. It's more content heavy. You might have activities, experiential activities, right? To do a little bit of facilitation can be, you know, a lot of trainers use facilitation techniques anyway. So for right. me, basically, is training is, you are content expert. Facilitation, you don't have to be a content expert. Consulting is about people got problem, you go and solve the problem. That is consulting. When you talk about team building, in my books anyway, it does not come in, in this line. Team building is an event. There are three phases. Pre-program or pre-event. Then you conduct the team building event itself. And then there's post-program. In pre-program, you might be a consultant doing things like uh, team effectiveness survey, climate survey, using tools uh, like Daniel is good at, like, you know, uh, on personality profiling, all this part of consultancy work, pre-programmed. Then, uh, also part of consultancy work, or you might also use facilitation to have focus conversation to come out with a focus group uh, using a lot of methods, a lot of processes to come up what the team really wants to focus on or the outcome of the team building event. Then in the team building event is all experiential activities, da, da, and you got uh, you can use uh, facilitation a bit. You know, after uh, basically it's reviewing uh, activities, and you have got a little bit of content maybe. And then the post program, you might switch your hair into looking at gaps and going into training mode or facilitation mode or even consulting mode. So training and all that minus consulting and platform speaking is all tools. All right. Yeah? How directive you want to be, how enabling you want to be. That's, that's from me, Isaac. Thanks, Cap. Um, appreciate that. Um, next, next person. Daniel, would you like to uh, go? Yeah. Yep. So uh, training involves a skill uh, and it's a very specific skill. In my opinion, it has to be something that is job related uh, and business driven. So that's training. Okay. Facilitating is when you have a problem and you, you want to resolve the problem collectively and come to a sort of an agreement. Then you utilize the skill of a facilitator to help you through that. So the avenue of getting to that uh, resolution. Uh, consulting is when you can't figure out an answer and you need to hire someone who can validate a uh, substantial response to that solution, right? That's very important. The, the fourth one was what? Team building. Uh, team building. Oh, big one. Ah, okay. So it's an, 
to me, it's an event as what uh, uh, Captain Shan discussed yesterday. However, there's so many forms of team building. Right? Uh, one would be those rara kumbaya, like I like to call timberling. Right? Uh, the timberling workshops are fun, you know, you go there, have a three-day high, you come back. Uh, but in organization development, there's also issues with uh, teams that are uh, dysfunctional, teams that are toxic, uh, teams that are not aligned, or even high-performing teams. That means teams are doing exceptionally well. Right? So these are some of the things that you do for, for teams. So there's team development, there's team alignment, there's team, you know, team bonding. What sort of team building event are you talking about? So you've got to be able to differentiate that. Did I miss something up? Um, then you have, what was it, platform speaking? Yeah, if you want to share speaking, that. I, I've, I've got a phone to pick with platform <laughs> speaking. Okay. Uh, it's just entertainment, pure entertainment. All right. It's supposed to entertain you, have some fun, laugh a lot, and then leave. Oh, okay. That was nice. All right. So, yeah, so that's my opinion. Thank you very much, Daniel. And I, I think. I, the thing is this, all of our opinions has some form of validity because we have gone through the industry, we have seen, we have seen what works, we have seen not, what doesn't work, right? So once again, viewers, as you are listening to it, I'm, I'm also encouraging you to process what we are sharing because the world is not two-dimensional, it is three-dimensional. So you know, feel free to ask questions, post, start posting a question yep. because today is going to be very, um, very back and forth kind of thing. Nasrin, mm. birthday boy. Yep. Okay. So uh, I'm going to deep dive a little bit because uh, Captain Sean and Daniel have, have explained that perfectly. I'm going to talk about it from a process perspective, right? So consulting is basically depending on, on what kind of consulting you're talking about. It can be, and as Shazi talked about, you can be a, a, an analytical consultant. When you come into a company and you say, let me figure out what, what, what's wrong. And here's the data. Congratulations, pay me. <laughs> Uh, you can also be <laughs> an applicative consultant where you do that and then you, you, you recommend what steps to, to take. Or you can do an end-to-end. -end. Um, I came from a company called Accenture, which team everything. End-to-end everything pun rata Which made it difficult for smaller boutique consulting uh, to, to, to survive. So what they did was they come in. This is what, what uh, was mentioned of Accenture by clients pre-2001. They said, uh, you guys have a tendency to show up and throw up, which means you come to a company, you tell us what's wrong, tell us what's wrong with us, and then you say, pay me. So uh, uh, they, they started to, to go into a trend of, okay, let's see if we can stay longer and if we can help you. So we understand the problem. Why would we hand off to another consultant? So typically from my understanding of the word consultant, it is uh, you can come in and find out the problems. You can come in and recommend solutions, or you can come in find out, recommend, and actually fix those solutions uh, those, or, or implement those. So uh, there are a few consulting companies on this planet that can do that. Uh, typically, when you use the word consultant, it means one human being who can only do one part of this. Uh, so that's, that's the process. In terms of training, I agree with Daniel, I agree with Captain Chan. Uh, typically, training or what I like to call uh, more instructing, which is you control the process, you control the learning outcome, you control the application. There is no way you, you can, you know, boleh uh, tak saya buat cara macam No, no, no. If you are working in oil and gas, if you're working in military, if you're working in finance, you're working in manufacturing, there is no ideas that you come up with unless it's an improvement that, that must go up to be approved. So when we talk about training specifically, uh, like, like Daniel said, it's a specific skill that you want to pick up to be able to do well there. And as a result of, of that, training in the 80s and the 70s, they were uh, mostly about technical skills. Back then, there was no such thing as soft skills training because, you know, you graduated with a degree, you were expected to be, to be, to be able to do that work. Uh, but only in, in the last 30, 40 years that, oh, I got soft skills training. Why? Because these people will never learn. <laughs> they never learn soft skills. Facilitation, facilitation is, and Daniel can correct me because he, he knows more about this, um, it is a process that's not controlled by the facilitator, but guided. So when you come in, nobody knows what the outcome is going to be, including the facilitator. But the facilitator knows when it's going too far. The facilitator knows when it's, it's going too slow. So sometimes he or she throws in something to make it go faster, right. sometimes slow it down. 
sometimes uh, when people are too excited, they say, oh, he, he goes, okay, okay, hang, hang back. Let's check this first. Don't suddenly celebrate something that, that you're not sure is, is true or not. So basically, if we were to use the word approach, these are all different approaches. Um, coaching, I think everybody will know coaching is uh, asking very powerful questions. And don't mix it up with sports coaching. People still get that confused. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, business or executive coaching, the word coaching did come from, from sports coaching. right? But it's two totally different things. Uh, if you do sports coaching, you do a lot of management as well. You do a lot of training as well. It comes under that banner. But when we talk about uh, executive coaching, life coaching, it's basically get, helping the other person to explore without actually giving them input. Different from training. Training, you actually provide that input. You actually say, this is the right way of doing it. Coaching is getting them to explore. Facilitating is getting them to explore as a group. So coaching plus, maybe facilitating, maybe facilitating could be coaching plus. Uh, but from the way I studied it, uh, even facilitating, you provide some input. When they're stuck, you provide something to, 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 to ease the way. And what was the other one? Was the team building, right? Yeah. Um, again, I'm not going to repeat what they've said. Uh, team building is where you can apply all of these approaches at different different levels. And uh, I agree with Captain Shan. I, I like I like his 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 definition. I actually learned something today. So that's that's how I approach it. Uh, not without re- needing to repeat everyone. So these are the different processes of each one. Thank you very much, Nazrin. Uh, I, think that, um, I think that's a good start for, for what we're doing today. Now, um, I thought just to do a bit of justice for a lot of team builders out there, right? I used to be in team building. Um, Daniel knows me. I was with one of the biggest team building companies in Singapore. We did a lot of fun stuff. One of the reasons I moved out was there's a lot of fun factor. I think the challenge is how do you marry them with content and stuff like that. I, I used to tell people, the difference between, between team building and consulting is team building is like candy floss. Consulting is like meatloaf, right? Uh, pack and heavy. If rip, you, if you, yeah. rip eye stick. <laughs> right? So, so there are differences. Yes, Nazrin. Nazrin, until it inter- All right. So, um, so now in the area of team building, once again, my experience with it is if you are in team building or you want to do team building, the key is novelty factor, right? If you are doing something which is three years ago, you're probably going to be very difficult. You want to focus on novelty factor. That's probably one, I would say that makes team building a lot different than the rest. You need to focus on novelty. So for example, you know, uh, Avengers come out. If you do an Avengers team building, I think you are able to do a better business than somebody who's doing a team building based on Rambo. You even know what that movie is all about. Right. So now that, that's in terms of the team building. Obviously, there are a number of things. For example, for those who are in team, let's put it as team rather than team building. You have this thing, the rara, which Daniel mentioned, and that focuses a lot on in terms of uh, what we call shared experiences. So one of the things that I so over the years I've also combined. I use rara team building to bring people closer to, together. So normally you do that in your what? new employee orientation so that will be helpful so once again i think and that's where we're going to go to the next question a purpose and the purpose of using it and once again when we use it at the right time that's where the highest value comes up so okay question okay. one basically helps the audience yes daniel i i cringe at at a lot of the you know these uh rara sessions because i it's very hard for me to to jive with that, but there is a purpose for it. Okay, for example, if the team really just, you know, there's nothing wrong with the team, they just want to spend some money, have some good time to, you know, you know enjoy themselves, uh, finish up their HRD fund, or am I not supposed to say HRD? Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, that's fine. Uh, but what, we, what I want the organization to do is not to waste that money. I want the organ, yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, you can yellow or red card me anytime, bro. Uh, they need to set some objective and some results or, or service level results with your consultant or with your trainer uh, in terms of business outcomes. You know, you, you need to set that in, in, the, in the beginning. And whoever is going to do that needs to have an, a clear understanding of the business that uh, he is he is working 
for. That means if, if I'm going to go in the automotive industry, at least he needs to know a little bit about the automotive industry. If he's going to do a hospitality industry, at least he needs to know a little bit about it. In the, you, know, you cannot have a team building facilitator not know anything. They're turning up for the first time. Oh, you're from ABC company. Oh, I think they do this one, huh? You know, that's unacceptable. <sighs> Uh, Daniel, I think that's, uh, that's a good one. Yes, Cap, I can see all the hairs all standing. Yes. <laughs> I totally agree with Daniel. I mean, let's, let's, <clears throat> let's talk about reality. You want to go for a company outing, don't go and tax your training budget. Go and have fun. Now, this is something needs to be addressed. Uh, because I have come across and I refuse to do it because just because they want to finish some training fund just to have a, a company retreat. Well, you can have company retreat, but include some specific outcomes. If not, I'm, I'm sorry, I will not be involved. I totally agree with uh, Daniel. Yeah. So as young trainers to whoever, to be very, very clear what the purpose is. And the outcome will decide your, uh, your process, your design. design. I'll pass it to Nazreen. Yes, yeah. Nazreen. Oh, guys, you touched upon all of our pet peeves, man. Uh, yeah, <laughs> this happens yeah. every December. Every December, you get a phone call say, "Hi, Cik Nazim, boleh buat team building tak? Kita tak nak cakap-cakap lah. Kita Bling. nak main main. I was like, okay, fine. I know exactly what you want. Let me pass you to my friend. So if it's a <laughs> if it's a retreat you want, you will get a retreat. But don't expect change. Don't expect yeah. to come back and and become closer or better or things like that. Um, and and because of that, because of so many people doing that and expecting that, it's sullied the word team building. Right? Team building is a beautiful, beautiful word, but it has, it has been dragged through the mud so much so that some people have, have taken to using team bonding, team binding to indicate, oh, ours is, ours is stronger. Um, but I'm going to push back a little bit away from us and onto the industry. If there are any industry people here, right? <laughs> Isaac, Isaac's panicking right now. <laughs> any I'm industry looking people for, I'm here, looking for the I how will, to I will, you out. You, you can't mute me. <laughs> Um, I'm going to say this, right? Be very aware of what you're spending for and why you're spending it. Because at this point in time with, with COVID and all of this, you need to actually make use of your funds the right way. And uh, one of the ways I, I, I can tell whether a company is serious or not about training is if they have a chief learning officer. If they have a chief learning officer, any funds get vetted for ROI. But if it gets stuck at training manager, and if the training manager is in here, I fully respect you. I want you to know that I understand your KPIs. Your KPI is spend the money. I fully understand that. However, oh, you, if you want to take that. You want to take that. <laughs> if you want to take that to a higher level, speak to your C-suite. Speak to your CEO and say other companies have changed. We need to change as well. We need to really monitor, track, and and you know uh, uh, make sure that what we're spending for in training or team building actually has a return and if that return is happier happier employees for one week okay that's the return if you are aiming for that that's what you get but you must really track you must really monitor otherwise um it tells trainers i'm telling you this right trainers know when you when you call them up and you say can we do team building and it's december they know you did not plan your budget well they know that you did not pay attention to, to, to you know, uh, how, how to spend. And they know that your company is, lay, is, is a bit, uh, uh, what's the word, left behind in terms of KPI. So why do you want to spend? Because if I don't spend on nothing, burn up, next year get less budget. That is not the way a company should run when it comes to learning. And if you, if you need to throw a book at your CEO, yeah. right, um, uh, the fifth discipline. Uh, Shazwan, if you can help me type, type into the text set. Or, or, or on, on Facebook, right? The book is, is by Peter M. Senge. It is a huge old book. 1990s new book. But everything he talks about in there is still relevant about learning organizations. He says that cash flow is the bloodline for, for, for the company. But the learning flow is the second bloodline. You only have cash, you get robots. You need to have learning so people improve every single day. Rant over. Oh, good. good. I thought, uh, that, that's... I think this is an excellent platform to talk about this, right? Because what you have all done is really talk about purpose, which is what we need to do in the first place. Instead of talking about training, we should pull back purpose, right? Now, one of the things I do when I start with clients is first thing is when they say, I want a two-day workshop on this, 
the first question is what do you want to achieve? And I think that's one thing I th- trainers and facilitators need to be able to ask, uh, what do you want to achieve first? Now, the challenge not obviously that, is, yeah. It, it, it's not just what you want to achieve, you know, can you identify the competency skill set from his competency <clears throat> model that you are trying to fulfill? You have yeah. a gap. If you don't have a gap, don't ask for training. All right, that's very important. Yeah. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. Yep. Daniel, Daniel, Daniel so, can you can you allow so me to tell me, a story? Uh, <laughs> oh guys, God. So, so I think well, I would like to move to the next question, but kind of summarize. Daniel, you're right. I find that's where when we talk about whether consultants and all, we have a different place. So, for example, most companies, at least SME level, are not familiar with this thing called competency standards and all. So part of part of our the way we support them is to develop. So if you are a training provider doing that and you, rec- and you ask the question, what do you want to achieve? And your next question, what competencies do you want to achieve? If the client goes blank, then you recognize that could be an area you want to work with them. Now, you'll be surprised with how many companies don't even know the competency that's one. Secondly is have they validated competency as of today compared to 20 years ago? So those are the challenges. Sorry, la. Yep. No <laughs> training provider will do that for you. La. So that, that's another discussion. For that's an day. opportunity. That's an opportunity for training providers to start ah. doing it because Daniel has just confirmed that nobody else does it. So you can start doing exactly, it. Exactly. Ah. So I mean, that's, hey, one that's more thing. One more thing. Just, just, yeah. just as an as a, as a off point, right? It means that there is a gap that we can, we can fill, trainers can fill, like maybe a certification for training managers to be able to learn this. Yeah. Training managers from SMEs. I think the, yeah, so it's possible. Um, now, this is where the big guys are coming in. So when you talk about Accenture, Deloitte, uh, I, I had the pleasure of working at Aeon Hewitt. Uh, amazing companies, and they are very strong in coming up with competency standards. And my, my experience was I worked with Aeon Hewitt on, on two major programs where they did the fact-finding and the competency standard. What I enjoyed with that was they, they shared the information for me, with me for me to design a program that fits the purpose. So I thought that was an amazing experience. Not many, SM, not many training providers are familiar because they do not have the experience nor the skill to do that, right? So, so that's my observation. Can I, I would like to bring up to the next question because I think we are bordering between the first and second, which is the pros, cons, as well as challenges associated with these approaches. So the hinging point is purpose, right? So if I look at purpose, in what situation training is a, and this, please share your experience rather than going to theory. Share experiences in what situation you found training to, is better fit, in what situation facilitation is better fit, and share your experiences. Who would like to go first? I'll go. Yeah. President, you want to go? No, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, okay. <clears throat> For me, it's coming back to what we are talking about competency-based learning. Again, uh, some trainers are experienced, some trainers can do competency mapping for the organization. That's where consultation comes in as a consultant. You do that work first. And then go in and identify the gap. And then you select the trainers for the right subject. Yeah. Right? And with the uh, you know, expertise in the particular areas of, of the gap. Again, we need to also be clear all problems are not training problems. Training does not solve all problems. It could be just the leader. Who's the oh, yeah. I have a story for you on that. Okay. So, <laughs> so again here is choosing whether the gap, the gap identified is for formal training. You know the 70-20-10 rule, right? Was it for formal training or on-the-job learning or self-directed learning? So when you identify uh, the approaches, and, uh, and employ the right approaches, then it'll be more effective. Not bring things that on job learning can, you know, and then you want to put them in the classroom. No, it's a complete waste of time. Uh, mm. they, can, yeah. can, I, can, I, can I ask to give an illustration where a situation client has asked you for certain things? Yeah. As you diagnose with them, you realize it's another intervention. Oh, yes. I went all the way from first, first, uh, first, uh, pitching in uh, here in KL and then went to the headquarters of the large um, MNC in JB and then went there. Uh, again, sorry to bring up this subject again, they wanted team building. I said, for what? <laughs> and he said that, no, my area, my country managers, 
uh, like for example, Greater China, the person who's Greater China and uh, the person who's in charge of South India, you know, they don't communicate and, and all that. So I said, uh, do you, uh, you know, when somebody goes on leave and, you know, these uh, clients are not, clients' requests are not being uh, addressed. Then I said, do you have a process for it? And he said, no. Then I say it's not a team building issue. It's not about people to people issue. It's uh, you need to bring person who is very good in process, drawing up processes, and you need to either train your people in the processes or get somebody to design the processes. So I am not good at it. That is not my area, and I walked out from it. Ah. So uh, again, here we also uh, as service providers, we also must be clear what we are good at, and sometimes it is again the purpose is very important what they want. I've had experience where I have also spoke about, you know, again, all these experiential activities and uh, all this, you know, going for <laughs> trekking for seven kilometers, eight kilometers, or high road low. I said, look, all those are equivalent to PowerPoint. And some of the outdoor trainers were very upset with me. You do not know about outdoor, you know, how important, how powerful it is. And I told them slowly, sorry, I did not carry my rank. I was an instructor in the army. How much outdoor you want to get? The activity yeah. of the tools, you know, does not decide what you want to achieve. You need to look at the purpose and the object, and then in your design process, select the right tools. I'm not saying that it's all useless. I, I do a lot of extreme outdoor stuff, but but you must need to fit the purpose. Just because you know it, you want to use it, and then it becomes what instructor shots and diri. All right. You know, Thank and you, the Captain. language they use, no psychology, safety at all. So this is where we need to choose, looking at the purpose, identify when you design. That's why, you know, even if you use the AD model or whatever model, there's an element of, you see, only, uh, let's say AD model, if we are using AD model, there are five components, right? One is conduct. It's only one fifth of the five phases in l and yep. I have refocused the rest. Don't only focus on the one fifth. It's the rest that matters as well. That will then tell you which process to use when. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to very quickly get Daniel and Nazrin to also share an experience. And I think using contrast is a great way where you were caught for one thing and you felt that it was supposed to be another intervention. Uh, Daniel? There is not, there's not enough due diligence done before the training starts. Can you give, uh, give an example based on your, based on your experience? Okay. A lot of HR get requests uh, from, from either the floor for this kind of training, that kind of training. And HR sometimes don't do enough due diligence to go to the floor and say, hey, can you tell me more about this? What's the situation there? Like, can you explain to me what, uh, you know, the processes that's going on? There's not a lot of it. It's just, oh, okay, I'll go find you a vendor. Law. Right? Mm -hmm. So that is, is really not the case. And a lot of times when, when we, people like Sean, myself, and Nazri, and a lot of the trainers that are watching this right now, get frustrated and we train the wrong thing just because we are listening to one way. So it's very important to go to the floor and figure out what's really the issue, what needs fixing, and if that thing needs fixing, what intervention? Leave it to us, please. Cool. If you are too lazy to do your job, then leave it to the, the consultant. Yeah. Okay? Because a lot of HR, I will say this very clearly because I know some of my clients are watching as well. You're detached from the business. You're so clueless of what's going on on the floor. You're just doing, your, you know, on your own little HR world. You have the glamour HR thing, but you have no clue what's going on. Right? Yep. You can't, you, yeah, the kita uh, jaga kita. Right. Fair enough. I think, I think this is where, uh, this is where, I, I think this is where as a trainer's consultant, right? I mean, two things, I, when we talk about competency, I'm starting to realize more for whether you call yourself trainers and facilitators, if you are client facing, two competencies. First is, I will call empathy to some extent a competency, the empathy with the client, because today's client, today's client, they know what they want, they may not have gotten the right information over time. So I'm giving them that. I think the other competency which I have painfully had to learn was diplomacy. I mean, we can disagree on all this, but I found diplomacy was the other thing. Um, I have, so, so that's something that I've noticed, right? Um, so let me just quickly move to Nazrin. 
in terms of your, your experience, contrasting the difference where you went for one and you felt was something else, question is why? And what we would like to see is the contrast or the top purpose of it. How many days do I have? <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Um, I'm, 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 I'm choosing. I'll, I'll, I'll just choose one, right? Uh, something yes. very early in my career. Uh, I was sent to do a uh, training needs analysis, a very simple one, with a uh, telco. Well, it wasn't a telco at the time, it was a, a, a fiber provider, it's still alive. Right. But at the time, they were transitioning from B2C to B2B. Okay. And while they were transitioning, what was happening is, I'll give you the background, what's happening is, the back end had stopped uh, servicing these products, but there were still customers. So I want right. to imagine, they called us in for their customer service uh, call center. And they said to us that our call center is not doing very well. They're not smart, they're not intelligent, they're not, they're not dealing with the, the, the calls very well. So we, I did the TNA and I asked a lot of questions and I got the answers and, and it, it went well. So I designed a customer service call center workshop, two days for them. And I was asking, so how you know, these people are very uneducated, they don't have education and stuff like that. So on the first day, I'm, I'm, watch, I, I'm introducing myself to them and they're introducing themselves to me. And then something really weird happens, you know. Um, I asked, so how long have you been here? And somebody goes, 12 years. Huh? Somebody says, seven years. Somebody says, five years. They've been in the call center 12 years. Wow. And then, guess who walks in as another participant? One of my university mates who took the same degree as me, graduated with me, and going, what are you doing here? Are you like, like the manager? He said, no, I'm in the call center. And I go, something's wrong here. So I asked everybody, so what are you, what are you uh, uh, educated in? Everybody had degrees. Wow. Something was wrong. So I, I, I went from trainer to facilitator mode and then unearthed everything. And then I decided, okay, we're going to stop this right now. But um, uh, sorry, sorry, it was a one-day course. So we're going to stop this right now. But I want your time because you've taken time off and I want to, to, to spend that time. I called my managing director and I explained to him and I, I gave him my proposal. He said, okay, go ahead with it. So what I did was, instead of delivering the course that they were supposed to learn, which they already know about, I, I pulled out something else from my, from my hard disk and I gave them a course which my managing director approved. I taught them something else which would actually help them. And when we went back to management, we discovered that the training manager, um, here's what happens. I, I'll, give, I'll give you this, right? Imagine you as a, as a Bangladeshi customer, and I'm saying, saying that specifically, a Bangladeshi customer calling up the call center and say, saya punya nombor tablet, tablet kasi hantam lah. And I discovered that that's the word they use. That's the actually the Malay word they use, hantam, which is press the, the buttons. So they had to buy, uh, uh, you remember these scratch cards yep, to, yep. to top up your, your, your phone, right? So they were using doing that, but they called the call center. This is exactly, I'm going to mimic this for you. Call center says, hello, yes. Ah, apa, apa masala? Okay, sekejap, yeah? Okay. They would put, <laughs> put the phone on the side. Hello? Sekarang sudah okay, kan? Ah, okay, terima kasih. <laughs> there was no back end. There was no support team to take care of all of that. And then I asked them, so how do you have like an intranet, like an internal system that you can refer for FAQs? They say, yes. What is it? It's a list of emails. Oh, wow. It's a list of emails that were sent by their boss, not even indexed. They, they just know where everything is. Okay. Nothing. So then we did, we did a bit of an audit. We went to the management and we discovered the training manager uh, wanted to be able to say to his boss that we've done our best. We sent him for training. They're still stupid. Oh, okay. Okay. So that. Yeah. there's more to the story, but I'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's, it's important for us to, or at least for new trainers to recognize, sometimes the, pr the, the situation being presented, we, we do need to dig a bit further. Uh, Captain Shan, you wanted to share something. Uh, your mic is off. You're, you're, uh, you're, you're on mute. Captain Shan, you're on mute. Uh, Daniel, you want to go first? You put up your hand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll give you an example. There are also multiple stakeholders to take care of. All right, when you go in there, you, you know, HR wants to have a say, procurement wants to have a say, you know, line managers want to have a say, big boss wants to have a say. In the end, you're, you're, you're having to fulfill multiple objectives and nothing that they want has anything to do with what the people that you're training needs. 
right? I'll give you an example of that. Uh, we, I worked on one with, in Shanghai, and this was for an automotive company. And one of the main issues that came out of that was, you know, when I arrived there, it was a four-day workshop of a sort of a, a very canned propaganda session that came out of Europe. Okay, they had this, they were delivering it uh, globally, and somehow I got the contract for, for Shanghai. When I arrived there, there were 20 people who were after-sales uh, managers. And they're saying, Daniel, we know all these, right? But we, we, we don't need all these. We know how to do this right, right? What we want is this. And I had to change the program, you know, quite drastically. However, to the, you know, the, the, you can see the reluctance of the Europeans who were sitting in the back of the room who expected me to deliver word for word what the slide says. Right. You know, it's a global program, and, is it? Yes. Yeah, global rollout, okay. Yes. You know, so, so it's... I, I had the same experience, so I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So it's very, it, for me, if you're a young consultant, um, please bear in mind that your, uh, how should I say, your, your client will give you a lot of multiple points of view without, you know, being very valid with their concerns. You have to do your homework to understand how to validate what you need to do to deliver results. Thank you very much. Um, I, from, from the sharing that you guys have done, perhaps one of the useful things for a new trainer facilitator if you are working through a training provider, ask all the questions that you need to ask and insist on some responses, right? If you are not getting responses, you may just want to tell them if you are not giving, if I don't understand this to deliver, because you need to remember if you are an independent consultant, your reputation is at stake. If you don't do the, if you don't ask the question properly and later on the project goes bust, it is not a training provider that is going to be taking it on. It is your reputation that's right. at stake. So please do ask your questions. Insist on your training providers that they do get back to you on those questions. The best is put a list on a paper and pass it to them. Let them go and ask the client. Better still is to insist on a meeting with the client. What I do is to always tell the training provider, I mean, I wouldn't say many. I have, so far, I'm only potentially going to be working with one training provider so far. Currently, I've always been going direct which is to insist on knowing the customer and speaking to the customer before you even finalize your design. Because I can guarantee you what you hear and what the client tells you can be totally different. So that, that's something to take note of. Very true. 90% um, you know, of the time. <laughs> right? I, I'm, I'm just holding back because I mean, I do have a lot of stories and some of the things you share resonate with me because I've gone through the same thing. Uh, in fact, one trainer got kicked out and got, they got me in because he was following strictly to the uh, facilitator's guide and I made changes for it and they retained me because of that. So those are, there are many, many stories on that. What, what I would like to do is uh, we are at 10.50 and I want to just bring to the third question and this third question, in a way, if we can give some nuggets, some bullet points, three or four bullet points on how you, what would you advise a new trainer, facilitator, consultant, what would your advice be to them in terms of starting out and looking across all these genres of uh, interventions we'll be talking about, right? Um, so, not, um, Daniel, Daniel, I yeah. see Daniel came up first. Yeah. yeah sorry. Three Hello or four. Mm. Uh, three or four. Uh, my, my own take uh, from this. Yes, please. this just, just say this is, this is from my, my, my own piece. Number one, it's not just because you know how to speak that you become a trainer. You need to be technically very sound in training technically very sound you need to really in fact go and study learning and development you know is to the deepest crevices that that it can provide you okay if you just know how to speak you know whether you're coming up from toastmasters or somewhere else doesn't make, make you a trainer okay number two learn to sell right you're gonna selling doesn't mean just the the, the you know, like direct selling trying to be pushy no Selling means you go in there and understand the client's problems and concerns. The size of your, the, the, the size of your contract depends on the, the size of problem that you can solve. And it's also your value, right? So the bigger the problem, you know, the bigger the contract. 
So understand that. The, the third one is, right, don't fake it till you make it. Because if you're up there doing something, doing something that is, is supposedly to help an organization grow, you can't fake it. You either know your subject matter or you don't. Okay, that's my treat. I, I rest my case. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, next, who would like to go next? All right, Nazrin. I can't follow both of them if you make me laugh. <laughs> because they're going to have really good answers. Um, so I'm going to bounce off what Daniel said. Just learn everything about LMD. At the foundation of that, you must love people. You must love mm. seeing people progress. Okay. Because if it's going to be about the money for you, then people can see that very early on. Or they'll see it later on. So you want to show that, you want to show, or you want not show. You want to have that passion to be able to help people progress. That's bullet point number one. Number two is constantly learn. Everybody in this room, right? Uh, right now are, are learners. They always learn new things every single day. When you say that I'm an expert already, then uh, it's time for you to leave. Because uh, even today, trainers who've been out here for 20, 30 years, suddenly COVID happens, they have to relearn everything from scratch. And the ones who complain versus the ones who act, okay, you can see the difference. I'm not saying one is right or wrong. I'm saying the one who acts fast, changes fast, they, they, get, they get more in the future. Well, the ones who just sit still and complain, that's the one that, that needs to learn very quickly how to change. Okay, that's number two. And number three is, uh, so number one is empathy. Number two is learn, learn, learn. And then number three is don't be so hard on yourself. When you want to, to, to learn about training, facilitation, things like that, start somewhere, right? Start somewhere and then move everywhere else. And then until you find your niche, okay? Don't, don't make mistakes. Actually study from people, not from books. Go mentor, go apprentice, go go and be a pencil, uh, you know, what they call a facilitator is tukang bagi pencil again. Start there. Learn the logistics, learn the event management, learn the timing, learn the setup, learn everything about end-to-end -end training. Because if something goes wrong, then you need to pick it up. If the projector blows up and you say, oh, saya tak boleh ajar hari ni, tak ada projector. Is the knowledge inside, the projector inside your head. I'm just going to leave you with that. <laughs> Nazrin, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, Captain Shan? Okay. Uh, my first point, same as... Uh, Captain Shan, just, just pause. Now, uh, those watching us, if you have questions, please start asking questions because there's no questions. The four of us are going for a tea break after this. All right, Captain <laughs> okay, Shan, go, go ahead. So, yeah, my, mine is exactly like Nazrin. First point, have the passion, have the heart. If you're going there for money, don't. God. People will see through you. Yeah? So you need to have that passion, and not everybody has got that, and that's okay too, because everybody has got their own uh, own calling, yeah, own calling. And about all the different approaches, know everything, and that's one of the things that, as one of the panel members, I stress for the National Competency Center (TTT). I said that, look, first, first module, you need to cover all this. What is facilitation? What is trainer? What is consultant's work? So that you know which one you are suitable for. You know? Maybe you should include this video in that in that package. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. That we created that about three years ago. Ah, no, okay. So anyway, be authentic, mm. and always know someone is better than you. When you when you feel, I always have been like that, and I said, no, no, no. There's someone even to the client. Sometimes I say that, look, thank you for inviting me. You know, if it's just you, they, they say, Sean, you know, are we also looking at two, three more vendors? I said, please do because you are the custodian of your own company fund. There will be someone who will be better than me who can really do justice, right? So be authentic, and because that also will inspire you to continuously learn, like what uh, uh, Rajdeep was saying is also right. And have the courage, lah. Have the courage to say, "Hey, look, this is not for me. I don't know." That's okay, and that's okay. And have a mentor and participate in community or practice, the the right ones. Not the ones driving for their self, <laughs> self agenda. And always, always know there is nothing about you. You are just the vessel. The people that you are impacting is the most. And we are in a, I always feel blessed, blessed because grateful and thankful that I'm in this industry and I could, you know, contribute to people's life, not only just change lives, but also transform life. And in the process, I get paid, I change myself as well. I transform myself as well. 
So with no, I'm gonna stop at that. So yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I think amazing. What's interesting is we we all agree that you know recognize your passion, recognize your strength, right? Know what you are good at and focus on that. But you also need to know all the other things that's available. Right. I think the other thing that we all talked about during the second question is um, ask questions, don't just make assumptions. Because when you assume, you make an ass out of you and me. Right. So please ask questions. If you are working through a TP, please ask. If you don't think it's your subject matter expert, please be willing to take a step back. The question you need to ask is a uh, dent on your reputation greater than the loss of the cash in the pocket. So I think that's, I can't answer for you because we are in different stages, right? Um, if you really need the cash because things are really bad, then if you need to do, you need to do. And I'm not going to judge you on that. But if you need to think of the long-term plan also, where are you wanting to go towards, right? So, so, so yeah, these are the things. Um, wow, so far there's no question. So either people are listening or everybody is just glued and stunned, right? Um, ah, thank you. So we have a question. What mistakes are, and what can we take away from them? What mistakes? So, any any stories that can be learning points, gentlemen? Mistakes. Uh, sure. My, yes, Ken. My experience, I've done one mistake. Again, coming back to what you said earlier, we, and also what Daniel pointed out, there are a lot of stakeholders. Yeah. Did we? So I, I went for this this. This, this particular financial institutions went there, they wanted me, I did not ask enough questions. I took for granted. And, and uh, what happened was, they wanted for leadership development and then when I went to the actual program, they were all the people who were not promoted because of a lot of other problems. <laughs> so I had to basically throw everything, throw the slides, throw everything out and did a three days facilitation work, right? And uh, you know, changed the whole thing. And then I, you know, I really slapped myself. And I said I should have asked, uh, you know, not to take the the training manager's uh, point. And uh, you know, and there was no PowerPoint, nothing. It was just three days full conversation, facilitated conversation, focused conversation, and coaching. So that was one of the mistakes I did, which Daniel okay. pointed out. Remember, there are a lot of stakeholders involved. Identify them first, yeah? Cool. Yeah. And then other, Nazrin, Daniel, maybe just one story of mistakes that you have made and kind of enrich your experience moving forward? Um, I'm going to go off with that one. So I think Captain Shan has covered that pretty, pretty well, uh, which is know as much as possible. A lot of information. More, the more information you have, the, the, the more aware you'll be. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, good quality information, not red herrings. Like sometimes they do lie to you. Uh, so you want to find out and validate, confirm, how do you know? Tell me why. And, and sometimes you actually figure out, oh, they need leadership training. No, they don't need leadership training. They need critical thinking. So then you go, let me propose something else instead because what, what you've done is you've misidentified. Um, from me, I would say prepare, 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 over prepare and practice, practice, practice because um, you are a magician and uh, uh, literally like an illusionist, right? <laughs> have you ever walked into a magic show where the magician is setting up everything? No. Everything's no. set up for them. So when <coughs> they come in, right, you are already there. Some people say to me, no, no, no. Uh, uh, student, student must wait for Tok Guru. Tok Guru cannot wait for a student. I say, that's the other way around right now. Because if you think of yourself as a service provider, that's not the case. So that's, that's mine. That's right. Um, you brought out an interesting point. In what situation would a client bluff or lie? Could you share that? Because I think that's something not many people experience. Um, I've, <laughs> I, I, I told you one story so far about that telco. Um, um, it's usually personal interest. It's usually right. fear of, of management. And then they just want to plug a hole. Uh, okay. And they think that training is a way to plug that hole. The fact mm -hmm. is, they did not do their analysis properly or they don't know how to. And okay. when we come in, they won't allow us to do the analysis. So they will come up with you know, cognitive dissonance. They will try and rationalize it. Oh, it's not my fault. It's their fault. Whereas it could actually be training manager or HR, or in one case I found right now in Cambodia, actually the CEO's fault. Uh, and ah. I'm sure you've seen this before, right? Team building, CEO, CEO says, I want them to go for team building. Tapi CEO tak turun. <laughs> because they all are the problem, not the CEO. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, 
Daniel, is there anything from Daniel first? Yeah, uh, we my, got the last question. My last question would be my probably my biggest mistake. Uh, don't ever make assumptions. Uh, don't ever go in there thinking you know everything. Mm. Uh, don't ever, if you ever feel uh, confident, completely confident about things, please, uh, you're going to make a mistake. Right? Uh, so always go into every assignment, uh, you know, with a tinge of humility, right? And, and curiosity. And to me, uh, every client, you treat them differently. Never anything can, never everything, anything off the shelf. Uh, it will not work that way. Uh, I, and I also, my other biggest mistake for those who are young consultants out there, I think people, uh, you know, Ivan is still online. Um, you know, even though we've been in this industry for so long, Every day is a new day. It's a battle. You know, you have to really know how to run your business well, right? If you just focus on, you know, your passion or what you, are, what you really love and forget the business side of things, uh, you're going to lose out. So I hope they run their business well. Thanks a lot, Daniel. And um, you know, Gina shared something. She said, you know, they lie because sometimes they suspect you might report to the boss. This brings excellently to Nazrin's point earlier on is about do are we able to create a safe space for people to, to open up, right? So part of the skill sets, especially in facilitation, is how do you create a safe space for people to show up as themselves instead of putting on a, a image? Um, thank you very much for that. Um, yes, Captain Shan, your mind is on mute. Yeah, coming back to this lying thing, one, once uh, there was one experience a few years back that I already, you know, I don't want to mention which country, uh, came down, uh, they wanted to align a project team. So when I went, when, you know, one night before the training manager calls me, oh, I want to tell you, tell you something, Sean, you know, tomorrow if you, I'm going to have 25 participants, I think, and he said, if you get more than 10 participants, you'll be very, very lucky. I said, what? And this was after having a few meetings with them. And then one of the things that I, I did, really, there were only about 10 participants. And I, then I realized something was wrong. Then I asked them, uh, uh, I'll tell you later what, what, I, what I learned from there. Yeah? Then I asked them after that, what, what do you think and uh, what's happening? And he said, uh, we don't understand why you're doing this. I said, what do you mean? And our whole team has been dissolved, this man, because the project finished. What? And I didn't get this from the client. And right. then, then, I, then I found out, that is because that particular this project team, I mean the particular organization they were working for, it was oil and gas. Uh, once the project is over, they give you some funds to finish for post-project training. So just wanted to finish the budget. Mm. And then what I did, I come again, threw everything out, and I have facilitated a conversation. I said, okay, let's align expectation. So each of them from different different countries, all of them are going to work in different countries as leaders, so it came from how to uh, align their project team to how to lead multicultural teams and we facilitate that conversation. So now what I do, every time I go into the training room, okay, this is what has been designed. Between the training department, we had a conversation, this is what uh, our uh, program is. But you know what? The most important people in this room is you. What do you want to achieve at the end of the day? Coming back to, and, and let's have the alignment what the organization wants and what all of you individually wants. And if something is out of topic, fine. We park it and we'll try to address it and connect it. So again, there will be people, you know, to finish the budget. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Shan. I think that that's amazing. Uh, allow me to share my own experience. And this was a 18 month project that I was working on. And it goes back to stakeholder management. And especially if you are working with SMEs, it is important to map out who has blood ties with the owners in the factory or in the companies, right? Yes, so this yes. was a project when we spoke to the senior leadership team, everything was given. What they forgot to mention was the one or two person who's the, the one person who's the cousin of the owner. And we didn't have this. And we didn't, and throughout the whole thing, we realized a lot of the challenges happened because uh, he doesn't listen to people and people, they're not, say anything to him 
So the 18 months program, only halfway through, I actually confronted one of the C-suite guys. I said, why didn't you tell us this? And he just smiled, right? So I recognize that, especially you are working in SME companies, right? Because inevitably, in a family-run business, we, there's a belief that you cannot trust anybody but family. And therefore, we may, don't even need to talk about competencies, but it's important as consultants, as trainers, we need to know who's connected. Because they may not have positional power, but they have relational power. So you really need to, to recognize that. I have, okay, so good. That's one question uh, from John. Sorry, sorry. Daniel, yes? Can, can, I answer, uh, can, can I address that first? How you manage an MNC, a local GLC, a, a local Chinaman versus a, you know, a, a, a global brand, it is so different. Yeah. From even pharmaceuticals, you know, uh, a generic versus a branded versus a local, that you cannot know it all, okay? So either you learn to uh, develop your, your expertise in a certain industry or you're going to face a lot mm -hmm. of obstacles dealing with your stakeholders. That's important. Thanks, Can I Daniel. pop in for yeah. that, Isaac? So, oh, like so, one more, one, can, I, can I pop in? Okay, so uh, right. just to, to clarify the difference between facilitator and consultant. A consultant is someone who has frameworks. Someone yep. who comes in, actual processes, actual frameworks, repetitive frameworks, uh, some useful for different industries. A facilitator, like Sean says, does, Captain Sean says, does not need to know the subject matter. But if you're going to go into an oil and gas, you need to have uh, oil and gas experience or at least an oil and gas expert on your team to be able to guide you. So you're the process person who takes care of all the, the, the analysis. You need someone to give you that input. So just in case anybody got confused between uh, facilitator, consultant, like someone says again, well, consultant needs to have knowledge, which is why consultants tend to be older, uh, tend to be more experienced and from industry. Uh, I've, I've, seen, I've seen, oh my God, I've seen graduates just graduate, become trainers. And then their, their card says consultant. I said, do you even know what that means? How is it that you, what are you consulting about? Studying? Huh? Exam? Okay, run to her. <laughs> okay, cool it, cool it, cool it. Um, we can have a different conversation on that. Um, now, Jonathan Chin has this question. I'm opening up. Let's try to make it succinct to the point. How do you measure results of your training? How do you measure? So it's how do you measure results of your training? Uh, I guess the usual one is the workshop evaluation, right? That's the one everybody talks about. Yeah, sure. Can I go first? Yes. So um, if you look at the Kirkpatrick model, uh, Jonathan, if I, I, I cannot communicate, communicate with you directly, but there are several ways you can measure. You can measure at level one, which is just happy sheet. I like this course. Or uh, you can measure at uh, second one is learning, how much they retain over the course or over, over two weeks or three months or six months, whatever you measure. And then the third one is behavior change. Actual, they go back, they actually use it, they apply it. Uh, or further up the net results, actual results as, a res as an output of that behavior. Less mistakes, increased productivity, things like that come in early on time. So, so from the behavior change, you actually get to see impact. And then last one, which is not from Kirkpatrick, but added on to that, which is level five, which is ROI, return on investment, which you multiply all that number with their salary. And then you get how much you've saved or how much you get back from that. So yeah. how I do it, how I do it is uh, when I go into the client, we set a KPI to hit. We negotiate a KPI to hit. Uh, I find out as much about the participant as possible, how much education they have, how much experience they have. And then I and the, the C-suite, we sit down or at least whoever's negotiating for the company. Okay, so what's realistic for us to hit in three months? So depending on whether we do coaching or, or workshops, it doesn't matter what the methodology of application is, I'll give you an example. Maybe you do two days workshop and then three months of coaching to, to, to make sure that they're on track. And we use a performance checklist where they check themselves off against uh, what they're supposed to target to hit. So they set a one week target or two weeks target or one, one month target and three months target. By the end of that, we should have hit the minimum KPI. If you hit above that KPI, then bonus. Lah. Uh, but you want to be okay. able to hit that KPI. That's it. Daniel, quick one. Yeah. 
Uh, I totally agree with Nazrin. I'll add a few more things uh, onto that. Number one is competencies uh, that they need to demonstrate. That means, can they demonstrate at the end of the course the actual behavioral descriptors that you have already set up? That means right. I already set a goal that they have to be able to perform this way. There's no two, two ways about this. So at the end of the program, there is assessment. Okay, that's training. A lot of people don't do that, right? And then at the end of, let's just say, whether it's the sustained learning or not, that means uh, maybe a month after the workshop, they, are they still demonstrating those, those same skills, all right? If it's a sales training program, did the sales go up? Yeah. Did they do those be, do, did they demonstrate those behaviors at the at, at the, the client's place? So these are things that are very clearly measurable. However, trainers don't do that. You know, and, and I've got an issue with that as well for another okay. day. Thank you. Captain Chan. Okay. Um again, Magrit, Daniel, uh Nazrin, you put it well. I, I'm trained by ROI Institute, uh, and we, we go until level five, which is measuring the return of investment. Now, must be very, very careful. Again, putting all the five levels, uh, what they expect. Now, just for, uh, the, the, what the research has shown is almost about 80 to 90% will do level one, the happy sheet uh, Nazri was talking about. Then most of us now require to go until level three for their behavioral changes, right? And then uh, that's about 60, not even 50 to 60% might go there. And uh, behavior impact on business, and then measuring the ROI globally, only 15% of all programs can be measured to that extent. Sometimes wow. people will come and ask you, "Can you measure return on investment? How do you know? How do you know that your program is good?" I say, "I can measure. I've got all the processes. Let me tell you." And guess what? After level two, level three, most of the work must be done by the client because we need the figures, we need the data, and those are. Uh, sometimes sensitive, they don't want to share. Then I say, then they say, Tapala, now my love, we do until level two or level three. So yep. here it can be measured, but you need to know the uh, processes, you need to learn how to do it, and it's very, very important to understand, uh, like what Daniel said, the, the competencies and what behaviors and what are the behaviors that is going to uh, that you're going to demonstrate that will impact on business. So hmm. we need to be very clear on the process and steps. It's just not giving. You know, LinkedIn say one to five and then measure it. No, we need to uh, really, really understand the process to measure. And it's scientific and it's very, very scientific. Yeah. Thank you very much, Anat. And I think kind of like take away and summarizing on measurement, right? You do need to ask, the question they need to ask firstly, is it measurable at a heart, at a tangible? So for example, anything frontline or at a KPI level, that's easy to measure. The other measurement, which is a bit more subjective measurement, is on internal or more behavior that's not correlated, that's just correlated. So as l &D professionals, you do need to sit down and ask yourself, what are you measuring? Right? Not everything is easily measured. Sales is probably one of those which is quite obvious. If you do and your sales number don't go up, obviously there's something going wrong. Uh, so that's one of the things. Uh, so, um, so that's on the measure, right? We'll not go so far, but if, if you are a training, you are new, please go read up something on Kirkpatrick's evaluation model, right? There are different interpretations, but all of them brings up very similarly. And if you have a long-term project, you may want to be evaluating at different stages, not just one stage, right? Um, I use 360, when I do leadership development, I use 360 profiling tool because it does give me my pro and con, uh, my pre and post. So there are many, many tools. You need to ask and you need to work with your clients on what tool works in your situation. So, so that's, the, that's the time we have right now. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for being on this show. I really appreciate your time. I, our listeners are there. And for our listeners, as I was sharing earlier on, we are coming up with a mentoring program. Part of the mentoring program for this year is we are looking at tagging you with other trainers to shadow them so you have broad experiences. So that's something that we are currently working because uh, gentlemen, one of the things that I've always wanted to do is to be able to expose new trainers, new facilitators to different styles of training, different styles of facilitation. So one of the things that we have built into our mentoring program this year is uh, to tag them with at least two different uh, experienced trainers. So that's something that we are doing this year. Hopefully it goes well. I will definitely I will definitely get you guys involved also on this. <laughs>
Anytime. Um, um, that's all the time we have now. Uh, with that, gentlemen, give a goodbye to everybody. Thank you very much.